Beer is awful, right? Wrong. There are countless local breweries all over the country that make great beer. Amazing beer, also known as craft beer. Beer you can savor rather than chug. Each week, we'll take you to a brewery, brew pub, or beer festival, give you a tour, and then drink the beer. All of it for the betterment of mankind. The beer you drink can be great. So put down that red party cup and start drinking beer like an adult. This is Crafty. Hi, and welcome to Crafty, the web series about great local beer. I'm Grant, and we're at Hangar 24 Craft Brewery in beautiful Redlands, California. So before we go inside, I'm gonna give Aaron a call, figure out where the f he is. Meet me at the ice cream shop, I'll buy you. Oh, hey man. Hey, where are you at? I'm at the University of Redlands. My girlfriend's graduating today. Where is that, Texas? Yes. Why are you gonna be much longer? We're already rolling. Um, yeah, it should be over soon. Well, hurry up, man. I'm working real hard here, trying to save up for college. Your mom goes to college. We only let you co-host the show because we get a tax break for hiring retards. All right, peace, man. All right, kids. While we wait for Aaron to show up, let's go inside and grab a pint. It is festive in here. It's a big place. Kind of looks like an old airplane hangar or something. Tanks are kind of right in the middle of the whole operation. This uh, Berliner Weiss flavor kind of deal, is that a thing? $25, really. That sounds more than fair. Pretty. Grant, first name? Got it. Thank you, sir. It's a nice patio, a delightful misting system. It's neato sitting right here across the street from a real live working airfield. Insert B-roll of plane moving. Meet me at the ice cream shop. I'll buy you. Yo, what's up? Is there anything you want me to ask Ben and Kevin? Ask him if having a brewery in a college town is either a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe you should show up and ask him yourself. Stephanie Ann Ritter. Second major. Yes, yeah. Chromosomal missing. It's good. Loud noises. Yeah, I'm hanging up now. Bye. Okay, bye. I'll be there. Like, seriously, it's two miles away. Look who finally decided to show up. You know, fashionably late. I've actually been here for a while, though. That's weird. Your beard sounded about two inches shorter on the phone. I mean, I shaved this morning. Whatever. Let's go find Ben. See what he's up to. Sure, yeah. Hey. How's it going, Ben? Good, how are you? Aaron. Grant. Aaron? Ben. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, good, how are you? Ben, can we be friends on Untapped? Sure. Cool. <laughs> so, Ben, you guys haven't been around that long, but you're doing pretty great. I always got to give credit to the beer that we're producing, first and foremost. The community that supports us and really helped get us off the ground. We use a lot of local ingredients. We have a lot of farmers that give us the ingredients we need to make our beers unique. I looked all around Southern California. I was born and raised in SoCal, and it turned out I'm right in my backyard. You know, I was living here, just finished getting my pilot's license. I think that being in a city that really helps its businesses get started is extremely important. So Ben, what made you decide to start the distribution side of the company? Didn't really want to get into distribution, but at the beginning we were too small. When I opened, I only had like three accounts. They were just my buddies that were the bar managers and you know, kind of hooked it up. Once we grew our account base big enough, then other breweries started saying, hey, can you take our beer with yours? And we're like, why not? Let's do it. The model's already been proven, so we gave it a shot and it's been working out really, really well for IE and Orange County. Ben, many would call your orange wheat your flagship, definitely one of your most recognizable beers. What led to the decision to source all the oranges that you use in it locally? The orange wheat and several other the recipes of our, our core brands were homebrew recipes that I've been brewing for you know seven, eight years, well before I ever even thought about opening a brewery. Oranges are grown all around us, so I just one day home from the homebrew shop, grabbed a bunch of oranges off a tree on the way home, and you know, threw it in. At the beginning, uh, it was 9% alcohol and way more orangey. But since then, I dialed that, you know, the, the alcohol way back over the years and dialed in the orange flavor. I guess, yeah, the, the crazy home brewer side of me is what brought in the oranges. And why not use local? Did you hear Angel City is brewing an avocado beer? What? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Dieter is a, is a friend of mine. We went to UC Davis Master Brewers program together. You guys plan on making avocado beer? We, no, nothing's in the works yet. We, we, we <laughs> you know, brew with a lot of different fruits. We still have a, a giant lineup of things we've got to get through, but you never know. You never know. We have avocados 100 yards down the road there, so. <laughs> Did orange wheat uh, lead to your uh, local field series? The orange wheat definitely spawned the local field series. Why is someone in Arizona going to want to buy our beer? You know, what makes us unique? You know, every brewery brews a pale ale, an IPA. Not many breweries are fortunate enough to have so many local farmers that surround the brewery. The idea I came up with was, let's brew beers that truly represent our geography, and you can't really copy that. 
So Ben, a lot of the bigger guys have been trying to put out sort of half-assed, wannabe, quote-unquote, craft beers, or maybe buying up smaller local breweries and then pushing their product through. Does it make you worry to see them kind of starting to edge into your share of the market? Uh, not for us. We can't produce enough beer. So, you know, whatever they're doing, it's not directly affecting us yet. As we get bigger, you know, the fight for shelf space is going to be the real big problem. But as the consumer gets more and more educated and looks into what they're doing, they're going to find out which brands are owned by the macro brewers. And they're going to find out that the stories aren't legit. You know, they're made up, you know, to fool the consumer, make them feel like they're small. You know, they can come to our brewery, you know, go go try to visit some of these breweries, you know, go find, you know, third shift, go find, go find that brewery, see where you end up. <laughs> you know, you can come here, you can meet the people that make the beer. You can stand right next to them having a beer, watching them make the beer. You know, you can't, you know, you can't replicate that. It's authenticity. So Ben, how big do you actually want to get? We don't really put a cap on how big we want to get. As big as we can get, the way I see it. Uh, it's exciting to grow. We get to employ more people. Uh, we're using more of our local produce, which helps keep this area from becoming, you know, just a gigantic urban sprawl. A lot of people try to say, oh wow, the bigger you get, you're selling out and all these sort of things. And your beer, you know, is less quality but it's the exact opposite the more resources we have i mean now we have a full dedicated lab we never had that you know we had some instruments that we hung on the wall you know now we have a full <laughs> dedicated lab our beer is the highest quality it's ever been since the day we opened you know as long as we stay true to our core values and who we are and uh, don't begin to change our beers to appeal to a broader audience uh, then i think it's it's a real positive thing so did you hear that Fox recently purchased the rights to start developing a sitcom based on Dogfish Head and their whole deal? I heard about that this morning, yeah. How does it make you feel seeing craft beer become a more and more visible part of the popular culture landscape? I have no uh, moral qualms about it. I mean, uh, if it works for them, then that's, that's cool, you know, like whatever. I don't see that that detracts from anything. If anything, it's going to introduce more people to, to try craft beer, and that helps all of us. If there was a sitcom based on Hanger, who would play you? I don't know. I think you'd, I'd want it to be funny, you know, so I don't know. Vince Vaughn always cracks me up. He's a big, tall, funny dude that's kind of serious sometimes. So. <laughs> so Ben, I heard, when, f So Ben, I was reading on the internets and I heard about this music festival uh, in Op, f So Ben, earlier this year at the Oppie Copy Music, <laughs> So Ben, recently at the Apikapi Music Festival in South Africa, a company decided to use a smartphone app and drones to airdrop beer to the concert goers. So given Hangar 24's obvious aerial theme and affinity for aerial maneuvers, when can we expect to see that deployed in Redlands? Well, <laughs> when uh, we get a lot bigger, that'll be another, another advantage of getting bigger when we can afford a drone. Uh, but yeah, it sounds very cool. We would love to do something like that. Maybe during our air show. I'm sure it'd be very popular party. at the University of Redlands. Yes, <laughs> yes. It'd be cool to just go drop off beer with my iPhone. That would be awesome. Probably stop by my house more than anywhere else, but it would still be cool. Is that true? Yeah. Very true. You want to do this one too? A lot of people have been talking recently about the craft beer bubble. The CEO of Founders Brewing, Mike Stevens, recently said in an interview that he wouldn't want to be in a startup brewery right now. Do you agree with that? It's definitely getting more and more competitive right now. and. Uh, it's, you know, the bigger you are, the easier it's gonna be. So we're definitely like kinda, I feel like we kinda sneaked in there into the bigger side where, you know, we're taken seriously amongst the distributors, but it's gonna be re very difficult for, for the new guys to get, get attention of distributors. So this company, Pat's Backcountry Beverages, recently released this kit where you can put in dehydrated beer and shake it up all together and have your own beer kinda concentrate on the go. What do yeah. you think of that? Is that the way beer is going? No, everything about that sounds horrible. It sounds disgusting. <laughs> yeah. If you want uh, Hangar 24 beer, where can you get it? Pretty much all the major metro areas in California and some non-metro areas. We also just launched in Vegas and in about a month we'll be in Reno, Tahoe area. Do you see yourself expanding more uh, across the country? Absolutely. Uh, next state is Arizona. Uh, thanks, Ben. Really appreciate yep. it. Yep. Cheers. Yep. Cheers. So moving right along, we're here with Kevin Wright, the head brewer of Hangar 24. So we've got 10 of our beers here. Um, some of these are uh, year-round beers, some of them are seasonal beers, some of them are special release. We'll start with the Helles Lager. So this is a traditional German-style lager uh, based on the beers that come out of the city of Munich. Uh, so this is a, a malt-forward beer. A little bit of hops in there for balance, but mostly this is malt and some yeast character. Helles in German means light or bright. Uh, but when you're talking German beer, they don't use light like L-I-T-E. They don't, they don't have beer like that. So it's just, just referring to the color. Where does this land on the uh, Louis Vuitton scale? Uh, that one, like three or four, it's low. 
You're asking me about Louvabon school? All right. <laughs> Pretty good, right? Yeah. yeah. No, that, it's very good. Very crisp, very refreshing. Yeah, I'd probably drink like a liter of this at a time. All right, the next beer. This is our orange wheat. Uh, this is our flagship beer. But this beer is unique in that we use the entire orange. They come in in boxes. We get a delivery every Monday from the Groves. And we take the orange, put it in a blender, puree it, uh, and then add that right into the beer. So you're getting everything. You're getting the skin, the pith, juice, seeds, the whole character of the orange. It's an American wheat beer base. So it's not, uh, it's not a half, it's not a wit, it doesn't have any kind of crazy uh, esters going on. This would probably be a great entrance to the world of craft beer. A lot of people have done, you know, either orange wheats or, or you know, different flavored wheats. This is by far the best. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we definitely didn't invent using citrus in beer, but right. as far as I know, we're the only people that use the entire orange and put that into the beer. It's, it's so really refreshing, does. the citrus. It's like taking a handful of pulped orange and just eating it. Yeah. What yeah, would that should. be like, I wonder? I wonder. Orange and grapefruit, you know, combined. This is a little more bitter because of the rind, you know? You got something on your face. So what's next? Next up is our Alt beer. Uh, this is another German-style beer. Uh, this is a, a barley-based German ale. You can really taste the barley. Yeah, yeah. We use uh, five different types of uh, specialty malts, caramelized malts in this, and really give it a nice kind of caramel, toffee flavor. Uh, next beer is our Oktoberfest, as traditional of a German Oktoberfest as you can get. We, uh, we use all German imported malts, all German imported hops. This is designed after more of the kind of older school, uh, maltier Oktoberfest. If you drink them now, they're a lot lighter than this. Do you have a really large basement where you store all the beer that you brew in March? No, it's not a, it's not a true Märzen style. Gotcha. I don't know if anybody does that anymore. Probably not. You know, I wish I had my, wish I had my Stein. We could, we could get you guys a proper pour of it, but... Next time. Next time. I'll bring my own. We noticed there's an absolutely beautiful and shiny new canning machine. Why cans? For us, major reason for doing cans is uh, accessibility of the beer. You can take a can anywhere. People don't like bottles at the beach, at pools, golf courses, camping, hiking, and you know where we are in Southern California, you've got access to all of that. And so we wanted to allow people to be able to take our beer to all those places. Uh, right now we're doing our, our Hellas Lager and our orange wheat in the cans. Uh, all right, so what's next in the lineup? Uh, next in the lineup is our Amarillo Pale Ale. So this is one of the original two beers that we brewed. Back then it was just called Pale Ale. We use Amarillo hops for the entire dry hop on this. So the citrus note in this beer comes from, from those Amarillo hops. It's more of a balanced bitterness. No, yeah. It's definitely very hop forward for a pale ale. Yeah, you get, and you get a little bit of malt in there, but uh, it's, it's designed to be um, a really nice kind of foray into hoppy beers, but very balanced and drinkable. Uh, this next one is our chocolate porter, an 8% strong porter oh, wow. brewed with uh, cocoa nib and vanilla bean added to the fermenter. You get a nice kind of roasty chocolateness from the, uh, the two malts uh, that we use, the two dark roasted malts, but then also some uh, from the cocoa nibs. And then the vanilla bean really kind of adds a, a balancing character and you get it more in the finish and it kind of helps accentuate some of the chocolate notes. No, this, this is really tasty. That is smooth and phenomenal. Do you guys ever throw some oak chips in there? Uh, we've done it on cask with oak chips, yeah. We've got, actually, we've got a, a bourbon barrel aged version of it uh, that's going to be released in a couple Today? of weeks. So, yeah, maybe, right we, now. We, maybe we can get a sample of that. It's on yeah. the bottling line right now. This is uh, called Barrel Roll Number 1 because this was the very first barrel roll beer that we, we released back in 2010. Um, every one of the beers is named after a different aerobatic maneuver. We had our uh, air show for our fifth anniversary out here in May and uh, some of the, the planes that we had did some of the maneuvers from the series, so that was cool. This is, uh, started as our chocolate porter, and then we aged it in bourbon barrels. Uh, it's been aging in bourbon barrels since November of last year. You get some of the, you know, the underlying beer, some of that chocolate porter notes, but it picks up uh, a ton from the barrels. Ooh, that is phenomenal. You get the, okay. the high alcohol esters just from the sniff, and a lot of vanilla, and the bourbon, and all that jazz. It almost reminds me of uh, the breweries' releases with their uh, Solarum brews. Like this tastes a lot like the Bois, but it's got more of like a chocolatey finish to it. What ABV is this? Uh, this year's version is 11.4 percent. So sessionable. So exactly, exactly. H how did the alcohol get to that level from the chocolate porter? Um, magic. 
All right, uh, next beer we'll try is our, our Polycot. That's part of our local field series, uh, which is a series of beers. Uh, this year we did seven of them. Uh, so this features uh, apricots. Uh, it's a, a wheat wine style, so it's 7.2% uh, wheat beer base. Do you guys puree the apricots like you do with oranges? Like, yeah. So it's the entire apricot? This year we had 7,800 pounds of apricots that we had to hand pit. Uh, next beer is our Columbus IPA from the, uh, the early boil editions through the late editions through dry hopping, it's all Columbus hops. Do you put any in the mash? Uh, we don't do mash hopping, okay. no. It's a good way to uh, burn money and waste hops. Uh, you know, most of the West Coast stuff is uh, lighter in color than this, uh, lower in the uh, kind of specialty malts used. But this, we, we wanted some of those because Columbus is a, a really assertive hop. Next one is our double IPA. This is uh, more of your traditional West Coast style, so you can see it's lighter in malt character. Sierra Nevada were, were the first brewers to commercially really use uh, Citra in the Torpedo, um, and I remember tasting that and being like, wow, there's, you know, there's, there's something in there that's, that's unique. We were developing the double IPA recipe at the time, and so we, we got some, put them in, and we're like, yeah, that's, that's the character that we want, that's the flavor that we want in there. It's also got some local honey from a, from a farm about half a mile that way. Just to bump there. up the ABV a little bit? Yeah, bump up the ABV, kind of lighten the body a little bit, and it also, I think, gives a kind of a, an impression of sweetness. It's very interesting. I've never heard of a double IPA with honey in it. How excited are you for uh, newer hop varieties coming out? We work with our hop suppliers, and we tell them any, any experimental stuff they have, we want it, we want to try it. You know, our, our brewers love it when we get a new hop sample. They want to brew a pilot right away, and then we all, you know, gather around the keg and taste it and smell it. And we're like, oh, I smell this, I smell this. Last beer that we've got is uh, a beer that we're currently working on developing. So right now it's called Experimental IPA, using some new hops that are available. Um, so this has some of the, the new Mosaic hop, which uh, really kind of came out last year. It's more of a, a sessionable style IPA, so it's 6.5% alcohol, a lot of floral, a lot of tropical fruit, uh, some berries, some stone fruit in there, and then you know a little bit of the classic kind of pine and, and citrus as well. I'm actually allergic to 90% of stone fruit. Hopefully not apricots. Yeah, apricots. Oh. Okay. I might die. So is there any fruit added into this or is it all just no, purely No, all, all the fruit character comes from the, the different hop blend that we use for it. A, there's a huge challenge between scaling up from small size to big size. Right. Um, and hops are one of the things that don't scale linearly at all. And so we felt that the only way we could really truly experiment with it is to brew it on the big scale. It's fun to, fun to experiment. Everybody experiments in college. How do you feel that uh, the University of Redlands has helped you grow? Uh, university is great. They run tests on some of our beer for us. Um, we've gotten interns from them. And the students buy a lot of the beer. Yeah, the ones that are 21 and up only, yes. If they were to develop a sitcom based on Hangar 24, who would you have play you? Who would I play me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm available, but it's like whatever. You're a little too short, though, I think. <laughs> Can it be anybody? anybody? Anybody. All right, a young Dolph Lundgren. Bold. Thank you guys for coming out. Cheers. Cheers. Jesus Christ. Well, Aaron, this is it. We need to figure out which Patrick Swayze was able to make the best pottery. Easy, easy runner-up would be the chocolate porter, and especially having tried it on nitro, it's a phenomenal beer, rich, robust, chocolatey, all the stuff I'm looking for in a porter. I remember a time when you made fun of me for liking dark beers. I don't know what I was talking about. The girl at the bar that caught my eye was the double IPA because it was just so phenomenally bright and uh, fruity and crisp and delicious. Super refreshing, very drinkable. On the board right here, I'm gonna go with the alt beer. In wintertime, it's, it's got enough dark characteristics like the malt flavor. In the summertime, it still has a nice light body. And uh, it's basically just my everyday kind of beer. But my favorite is gonna have to be the chocolate porter. Let's hang out and drink some more. I like that idea. That's it for this episode of Crafty. For more information about Hangar 24, please visit their website. And as always, remember, drink responsibly. And by that I mean, don't get so drunk you forget to check in on Untapped. Keep